Welcome to this edition of Peak Peak Performance Performance Podcast Podcast. with your host, Thor Conklin. Thor will be sharing the necessary tools, strategies, and psychology you'll need to become a peak performer in any area of your life or business. Welcome back to another episode of the Peak Performers Podcast. I'm your host, Thora Conklin, and today you are going to enjoy our guest. As a matter of fact, I pre-framed this with him before, and I'm like, I have no idea how we're going to get this in in 35 minutes, (laughs) but we will do it. With us today is Jeff Cohen. He's the founder of Florida Healthcare Law Firm, 31 years as an attorney. He's an all-around amazing businessman and an author. So, you know, what I love about you, Jeff, is well, I love a lot of things about you. And first, and just also a client of mine. So, you know, if I'm a little biased here, you may hear that too in uh, this interview. But no, this is just one amazing human being. And what I love is we talk an awful lot about niches. If you want to be rich, pick a niche. You know, this is not you know, a Florida, you know, whatever business law firm. It's a healthcare law firm providing attorney services to healthcare providers. So how'd you pick the niche and give us a little bit of that background? Yeah, I fell into it. It's a little bit like going to, uh, you know, a rescue center and go look for a dog and the dog kind of reaches out to you. That's kind of what happened to me. I was a lawyer who never met a lawyer. I didn't know what lawyers did. I ended up in law school through a very circuitous path and I was so successful at it that after two years, I was looking into teaching uh, high school. I was miserable, hated it, hated it. And so, you know, on a whim, I just kind of wrote down, well, if I stayed practicing law, what would it consist of? And I came up with like, I don't know, literally four or five things that it would have something to do with healthcare um, and a few other things. And the healthcare came from the fact that I'd served in the legislature as when I was in law school as an intern in the HRS committee in the House of Representatives in uh, Tallahassee. And I loved it. I just found the whole topic fascinating. I was always interested in health and I just figured healthcare. And out of the blue, I get a phone call to go get this interview over breakfast with a guy named John Thrasher for the Florida Medical Association. I didn't know who he was. I didn't know what the FMA was. And I end up getting not only the job, but I end up getting every one of those four or five things that was on the list. And uh, my wife and I end up in uh, Jacksonville where the FMA was. And I remember within about a month of starting, I remember going home and telling my then wife, uh, the mom of of my kids, I, I said to her, I can't believe I'm getting paid to do this. I should be paying them. And I, so I stumbled into it. In my third year as a lawyer, I'm doing something called healthcare law. I'm learning about healthcare law. And my job is to teach all the doctors around the state about all these laws as they come out. And I just loved it. Loved it. Well, you know, I absolutely love the niche. It's something that's not going to go away. There's tremendous litigation around anything to do with healthcare. Uh, you've picked the niche where your client base has the means to pay um, substantial fees when necessary. You know, I see a lot of businesses going into areas where it's like you're serving a community that just doesn't have the ability to pay the fees that are commensurate with uh, the work that you do. I remember when I was in the insurance uh, world, uh, I, there at a very young age, I looked and I said, "What is the niche within insurance that is, you know, where I need to be?" And it was aviation, it was maritime, and then private equity. And I went into the private equity space. You know, I asked you a few days ago. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I guess at this point, I said, you know, what business are you really in? And without hesitation, you said, we're a marketing company that just happens to do law. <laughs> you no, know, and, and, and it's brilliant because that should be the answer for every single business out there. I mean, because people get in their mind that, you know, if I build it, if I'm good enough, they'll just come. It doesn't work. So you, you really focus on your marketing efforts. Obviously, you've got to be extremely good at delivering the goods afterwards, but you never forget that you've got to be out there. You've got to be marketing. Where, where did you that know, come we, from? We, we backed into it. Honestly, we, we fell into that too. Um, You're falling into everything. <laughs> we fell into 
it. You know, if you asked me 10 years ago when I formed this firm, will people hire a lawyer they never met before? I would say, I don't know. I don't, I'm not really sure that they would, which explains why 10 years ago, I never had a website. I didn't know what SEO was. I couldn't spell SEO. I, I had no idea about marketing. I'd never done any because my experience f for 14 years before I opened this firm with a couple overhead sharing partners was you just kind of sit there and people call you. And so my business model really was overhead sharing arrangement, two partners, uh, a paralegal and me. And I made enough to take care of my kids and, and uh, pay the bills. And, but I got horribly bored, horribly bored. Like the last two years of that 14 year partnership, I was going, what am I doing? Is, is my health okay? I'm so bored. Um, the short story is I realized in a moment it was time for me to leave that firm. <clears throat> and when I, when I knew that I had to leave, that that, that, uh, that was the answer to my prayers, so to speak, I immediately began to understand that, oh, I'm going to turn, I'm going to form a firm that is the practice of law and also business. It's also a business. And, and it's also going to represent everything that I value as a human being and that I find uh, has integrity. So I'm going to create this representation of uh, what I value as a human being. And at the same time, I'm going to make a business out of it somehow. And fast forward, I meet this woman, amazing woman, Autumn, Autumn Galgano, um, who ultimately became my daughter-in-law. And she's got this sales and marketing background. And we just began to collaborate and create. And um, I get into a space that's like 2,700 square feet. It's just she and I eventually, just, just the two of us. And I said, you know, I guess we'll just fill it up somehow. We'll just figure it out. And then every day was Autumn and I brainstorming and having a great conversation, great fun. And here we are with nine lawyers and uh, 10 years later. And I remember saying about, I don't know, halfway into it, I said, you know, Autumn, I think what's going on here is we're going to build a marketing firm that provides legal services. <laughs> yeah. And now you're buying your own building. <laughs> exactly. And now we're, I'm buying my own building. You, can't fit, you don't yeah. have any more room left. No, Great. no. In fact, we got people doubled up and people working remotely and we have two more lawyers that want to join us. Yeah, absolutely. Now I know it wasn't all, um, you know, a easy path for you. You you had a model before, and as you kept growing, you just the money was evaporating. Oh, and it you, sucked. This has to this has to end. I've got to step back and I've got to re-engineer this thing. And you really just turned it on its head. Tell tell us about how did you get to the point that you finally said this is insane, and then what was? <laughs> yeah, the the short answer is like immense pain. That's yeah. the short answer. Yeah. So it was uh, the first year, and I had this idea that what I would do is I'd form this business inside the firm initially where we got people paid whatever managed care was and paying them. Them means healthcare providers. And so I had this person leading that charge, and her job was to head that up. And I kept coming in here, and then she would say, oh, we need to hire this person. So I would hire that person. Oh, we need to buy this software. I would buy this software. We need to hire. Pretty soon, this, fit, this place was really filled up with people that were going after money owed to providers by managed care payers. I didn't know anything at that time about um, holding people accountable. I didn't know anything about that time about being very specific on a game plan. I just, if you looked at me and you shook my hand, I trusted you if you were telling me what I wanted to hear. And that's really kind of how I operated at that time in my life. Um, life is funny. And so God put in my life uh, a woman that doesn't trust people easily. And I ended up marrying her. And she's telling me all along that first year, Jeff, this woman is stealing from you. And she's making these claims and she doesn't know what she's doing. And, oh, my God. And, and she said to me, you know, I'm going to have to leave you because I can't stand watching you get hurt like this. And I'm thinking, what is she talking about? My best friend, Mark, saying the same thing. And I'm going, these poor people are blind. They don't understand that I'm on to something really fantastic. And um, so I sat down with this woman that was heading up, and I made a deal with my wife. And I said, look, give me 30 days. 
And she said, okay, I'll give you 30 days. So I sit down with this woman and I said, look, how much is, is going to be here? This much money. Okay, great. How about within two weeks? Oh, this much. How about four weeks? Oh, well, much more. So two weeks later, I meet with her and um, nothing, nothing. And I immediately realized that for 10 months, my wife wringing her hands and pulling her hair out, she had good reason. She had excellent instincts excellent uh, awareness and so did my buddy mark and lynn my my dear friends and they knew stuff that i didn't know and i and i was i'd navigated into my life on my own that way if i didn't see it i didn't believe it and i didn't take in people's input um uh unless i agreed with it at that time of my life yeah well, everything changed and i learned to um, hold people accountable. I learned, to tr I developed a gut instinct. I understood that there were people that were really out for themselves, even at my expense, but I didn't know that at that time in my life. So I had a very significant perceptual growth spurt. Um, and at that time, uh, I fired everybody that was in this office except for Autumn. And I said, you know, I don't want a model where people are just sitting here uh, trying to get as much as they possibly can from me and delivering as little as they have to because I felt like this is a bunch of children and that was my overwhelming feeling and I had three kids of my own I didn't want more kids so I fired everybody over a short period of time and I asked myself what model could I create of a law firm that I've never heard before but everybody's expected just like me to step up and deliver and so I created a, a totally different compensation model where people are paid based on how much uh, is, is collected by their own services. And then um, we would give them every kind of support to be successful. And that's the model. Yeah. You find the business, you give it to them, they do the work, they bill it. You know, it, it's interesting. I, I think so often as entrepreneurs, you know, we think that the employees are going to act like entrepreneurs. That is completely yep. different. Yeah. Um, and just yeah. like kids, employees are looking for direction. They're looking for structure. They're looking for accountability. They may not like it, but we all need it. You know, yeah. you and I have accountability. I've got a coach. I tell him what I'm going to do, and damn it, I'm, I'm responsible now. I, now I've, do I like it at times? No, but it drives behavior. Behavior drives results. You know, you mentioned something about uh, your wife. It, it, for all the male entrepreneurs listening today, if you are in an environment where you do not have a woman advising and protecting your back, you better go get one. Because oh, yeah. I'm telling you, they are so yeah. much better at seeing stuff. Uh, I bought a yeah. company 10 years ago, uh, and my then wife said, don't do it. This is not a good idea. I'm like, I'm the business guy. I got this, okay? <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a couple of things I see, but you know, I got this. Well, right before I had a net million dollar loss, cash, uh, I decided to close that business. Had to close that business. Otherwise, it was insane to just keep it going. So a million bucks down the drain, simply because I did not listen to the intuition of a very knowledgeable and smart woman. So- uh, you might think you're smart, but if you're not a girl, you better have a girl close by telling you, uh, seeing the things that you don't see. Um, you know, I want to touch a little bit on, uh, you know, I, I love a model where uh, everybody, business comes in, they bill it, they get paid a percentage of what they, what they bill and what they collect. But even in that environment, you and I discovered that you would think it would be really simple, right? If you're getting paid on what you end up billing and collect, everybody would be out there just making sure that everything, all the work that they did was acknowledged, was tracked, was collected, and tell them what we found out. Yeah, that, you know, one of the biggest, you alluded to it before, that one of the biggest mistakes that we make, not just as, as business people, but as human beings, is to think that people value the same stuff in the same way, and they don't. We're all wired differently. We're all motivated by different things. And what I found was, even though I was wired in a kind of a business-minded way to be of service to people, but also to be financially uh, impactful and, and to derive commensurate value with the value that I was delivering, that's not the way everybody thinks. And so I found that some people were really motivated by 
um, I just want to feel significant, or I just want to be of service, or I just want to, you know, in fact, what we found here is the vast majority of the lawyers that came here are incredibly motivated to care for other people. Yeah. But they're not nearly as motivated to care for themselves. Mm. And, you know, I love that. And in fact, I only want to be around people that are caring people like that. And we wouldn't anymore hire somebody that was more focused on themselves than they are the value that they're delivering. I'll never hire somebody like that. We don't want to be around people like that. And yet it creates a challenge because, you know, if you're going to deliver remarkable value, you also have to be focused on the value that you derive. There's a certain balance there. And so we have moved into, especially myself, I've moved more into working for the employees and the lawyers here than I do for clients. And so now what Autumn and I do is we really find what motivates people. We find the blockage, blockages in their brains or in their, in their work style. We, we get you on the phone and we have you help them if that's what they want. They reverse engineer. They, they just create a uh, greater fulfillment for themselves and a greater experience, not just interesting, not just here, but in their lives. And so what we see is that human beings that come in here, if, if they're, if they're compatible with this place and we're really doing the right job for them, helping them be successful, they thrive as human beings. Yeah. And, and you know, look as attorneys, Sometimes you just want to be able to pick up the phone, talk to your client, and not bill them. Perfectly fine. It's like, you know what? This is, this is on the house. This is good. Absolutely. But what ended up happening, as soon as we started to track everything, including the things that weren't being billed, a light bulb went off, and I was like, you know, I really enjoy doing this. But over the course of a week, wow, that turned out to be seven hours. Is that yeah. something that I really want to be doing? And then the other thing was, when we figured out that if we do work, we take the time to account for what we've done that day and not wait until next Tuesday to go back and go, what did I do? Yeah, okay. Everything just shot up because when we delay in tracking and measuring, no matter what we're doing, things mm -hmm. kind of slip between the cracks. Mm-hmm. I remember reading something somewhere. I think it might have been a Charlie Munger quote, or it might have been somebody else who said, uh, you can't change what you don't measure. Yeah. And, and we've definitely, with your help, um, helped everybody realize that, and it's changed all of our behavior. Yeah. I remember uh, listening to something uh, recently with Grant Cardone. He goes, his team sends him numbers on some of the metrics that he tracks every 15 minutes. Every 15 minutes, he's getting a report. He's getting someone running his office and go, okay, here's the latest report on X, Y, and Z. Yeah, yeah. Where do you think his business is going? Yeah, up. Up, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You've got right. to track and measure. Tell us, um, what are some of, besides what you've already mentioned, what are some of the things that you look back on and go, man, I, 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 I missed the ball on that. I, I, that was not that was not good. What are some of the learnings along the way? Because one of the things I know that drives you is, and you're starting to get into this. I want to get into this uh, with the book that you just uh, published. You're doing a lot of work in mentoring, not only young attorneys inside of your office, but you're now taking that show on the road. You're doing uh, talks and it's so important. I remember when I was young in the insurance business, you know, I had this old guy, Jack Schramm, Never forget him. And just this old crotchety guy. And I'd be like, Jack, I need some help with, I don't have time for this kid. You know, uh, it was still when you could smoke in your office. So you'd be smoking a cigar, you know, and I'd leave, you know, it's like, get back in here. I'll, I'll talk to you, you know, and we need those things. We need that, that experienced advisor, mentor, coach to help us. What are some of the things that you're telling young attorneys and, and business owners in general? Uh, some of the pitfalls that you've made and, and not to fall into? <laughs> you know, um, they all make the same mistakes that I've made. Believing what they want to believe instead of what's in front of them uh, is a big thing. Um, thinking that if they shift focus, that they're going to somehow augment their business. So, for example, there was a fellow that was in, and he had a hard time 
he, he came in because he wanted to launch this new service line in his, in his practice. And I said, great. And so, you know, we're talking about it, and it's a great service line. And I said, help me understand why you want to do that. And he said, because, and he said something interesting. He said, because business in my primary uh, service line had fallen off. So I kind of put my pencil down. And I said, well, why do you think that is? And he was stumped. And we found out in a very short conversation, he doesn't have any sales. He doesn't have any marketing. And I said, the problem is you're selling oranges. That's your business. And you think that you're going to sell more if you start selling lemons but you don't know how to do sales or marketing. Why don't we focus on getting you with the people that can help you with sales and marketing so you don't have to create a second line of business. And then if you want to, then you can do it. But my fear is that you now sell lemons. You won't sell very many lemons, just like you're not selling very many oranges. So, you know, we get so close as business people to our own operations we can't see what's obvious to other people that are looking at it so I, I think one of the biggest challenges for me and for our clients is perspective mm. so yeah. the people that come here we don't just operationalize what they come in for I mean we don't just do what they ask we don't just give them the contract they want we don't just you know, solve the problem they think they have. We help them find the problem they don't know they have. And, and, and that's what a great attorney does, right? Because you're there. At, at the end of the day, what are you really doing for your client? You're getting them out of a jam or you're preventing them from going into a jam. And sometimes that has nothing to do with, as you said, what they came in with. Yep. Uh, in fact, it's very common that yeah. it's not what they think it is. We had a guy come in years ago and he was trying to get this contract put together and he was certain, you know, and he was in with his wife to your point about women. And so I'm watching the client talk to me, the story about how if he just works out this contractual relationship, everything's going to be perfect. And his wife from her body language, she's being very respectful, but she's her body language. She's not having any of it. So I'm waiting for a break in the story to look at her and say, well, what do you think? Because I, I could tell she knows the truth, and he has a story that isn't the truth. And she basically says, even with the perfect contract, you're not going to be happy. And he puts his head down, and tears come out of this guy's eyes. So he knew what the problem was. The problem was it, that wasn't the problem. Yeah. The problem was no matter how well he did in that relationship, he was not going to be happy. And she knew it. Yeah. Always find that root problem. So often, you know, clients will come to us and say, okay, I've got this problem. And I'm like, well, what's the real problem? They're like, no, it's this. I'm like, no, that's not the real problem. Yeah. That's a symptom of the problem. So if you want to go around and start attacking symptoms, it's kind of like that whack-a-mole uh, game, remember yeah. that? You get this hammer and you whack the thing as it pops up. Those are like symptoms. The problem yeah. is it's still plugged in. You want to solve the problem of those things popping up, unplug the machine. Find the root cause. You know, I had a client uh, a couple weeks ago uh, give me a contract. I said, would you review this? I said, sure. So I looked at it uh, and uh, she goes, I, I think I got to change this word to this word. I'm like, let's stop for just one moment. I said, first of all, you're a minority uh, shareholder. You're class B stock and they're going to be controlling all the bank accounts. Do you really want to have joint and severable liability? You know, and she goes, what's that? I said, uh, well, if they take out a $5 million loan, you're on the hook. <laughs> yeah, it's your way, ass you too. don't have any money and you're the only one that does. So let's not concentrate on how this language is going to look. Let's look at the root problem. Yeah. You know, I, I, as so much of what we, uh, we stumble with in business is asking the wrong question. Yeah. You know. And that's why it's, this, I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate because I have essentially a business partner here that I collaborate with nearly every day. And then we've got you. And so this conversation, there's something magical about having a conversation with another person that I trust and respect because I hear shit. It's not always that they say something that's magical. Sometimes it just something pops out of my mouth and I go, oh my God, but it never would have popped out if I'm just believing my own thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Get, get your team around you. No yep. question.
Yeah. Let's shift uh, for a moment here and uh, tell us about the new book. <laughs> Why? You know, you're running a successful law firm. You've got <coughs> you to the position where you know you are truly the owner of a law firm. You don't do a lot of practicing of law anymore. You've got the uh, the lawyers in the firm doing most of that. Uh, you are the person that is leading the firm, and uh, why, at this point, write a book? Because you know what, it was in me. I, I'd gone through this personal journey from suffering to happiness, if you will. I mean, I'm oversimplifying it, but I had a bunch of challenges in my life. I went through them. I sought a lot of help, a lot of healing, a lot of, and I took this journey, this kind of wild ride. And on the other side of that journey. I just felt like, God, I, I, I want to I wanna tell these stories for people who might be having a similar challenge. Usually, I'm, and I imagined it would be men in their teens, 20s, 30s, maybe even 40s especially. And I just wanted to deliver everything that I'd learned in hopes that other guys especially could look at that and go, ah, there I am. And... There's good stuff here that I can use. I just wanted to help other guys. I, I was hoping that in writing the book and just kind of putting it out there, that other people would find their journey to be a little bit easier and a little bit more fulfilling. That that's what that's what motivated me. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna be really surprised uh, at the number of comments, the emails you get, the phone calls you get, the outreach um, when you put something in the marketplace like that. Uh, it comes back to 20 fold and you're going to see things and hear from people and, and hear the stories from them of the changes that you've made in their life. And, and that to me is the reward out of everything. Yeah. I yeah. know it just went on uh, Amazon yeah. as a, a pre-sale in the uh, notes uh, in the show notes, you're going to see a link to uh, order that book. Uh, it's going to set you back a whole $4 and 95 cents. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> No excuse uh, not to buy the book. Uh, I just ordered my copy today. I'm looking forward to uh, when that arrives. So if you had any parting advice for the, uh, the listeners, um, oh, and get, uh, all, everything else will be in the show notes as far as social media, contact information. So you, we'll have that uh, there. Cool. But give us Thanks. some parting advice. Hmm. Thanks. <laughs> you I know was what? Like, I've never seen you for anything. <laughs> exactly. You know, just keep going. Stay. Get cur Get more curious than you've ever been, and keep going. You know, my journey is like everybody else's journey. It's kind of like trial and error. I've always been a very curious person, and I've always looked for in difficult times, if I could just learn something from this, then it's not just suffering. So, and, and the thing that's really driven me is I'm just an incredibly curious person and I'm remarkably persistent. I'm not, I, I just, I just keep going. So, you know, every, if, if I, I could say anything encouraging to people that are listening, it's the next great breakthrough and life changing lesson is on the other side of the most difficult thing that's right in front of you. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking about it earlier. It's, yep. it, you do all the work to get to the difficult part. When it gets hard, you know you're ready to make a breakthrough. Yeah. So many. Every miracle was on the other side of that knee buckling, heart wrenching moment. Every life changing moment I've ever experienced was right there. Yeah, and, and failure way to success. Everything that we've learned in life has come from failures. Tying your shoes, riding a bike, walking, reading, writing, you know, and then we get into business and all of a sudden it's like, I don't want to fail. Well, if you don't want to fail, you're not going to succeed. You've got to right. get there and just keep going. Now, you have to intelligently fail. Don't bet the farm because not everything's going to work. But keep failing, keep moving forward. And uh, I wish you the very best, Jeff. Love you as a client. Love you as a, as a person, man. Just keep going. Can't wait to get the book. And uh, Thanks, brother. Thank you, for, uh, thank you man. Thanks for everything. Right, Appreciate man. it. Thanks.